We are back with It Feels Right. Adam Stone's back in the studio today. My God, it's good to see his beautiful face. We're going to be going over a lot of MLP mechanics, what's happening, uh, what the draft looks like, how the bidding process works, and much more. Yeah, we got the tip of the day talking about how to defend the shake and bake, a pretty hot topic lately, and a light preview of the PPA and North Carolina coming up this weekend. Let's get it. Because you know why? Why? Because it feels right. It feels right. Legendary. Ladies and gents, before we hop into the show, I do want to talk to you a little bit about Selkirk's amazing line of pickleball nets. And whether you're just starting out or you're a seasoned pro, Selkirk has the perfect net for you. When you choose a Selkirk net, you're not just choosing any net, you're opting for the official net of the PPA Tour, where excellence meets professional play. With Selkirk Slide and Nets, you can play pickleball anywhere. Selkirk Strange and Nets caters to every player's needs, offering budget-friendly choices for casual enthusiasts and premium options for those with the competitive edge that are looking for more of the pro-level net. So either way, you're ensuring quality play for all levels. And I've got a Selkirk net for myself. And let me tell you, it's a game changer. It's all about playing on your terms wherever you are, whether it's the driveway or on the PPA Tour. So if you love pickleball as much as I do and we do here at It Feels Right Podcast, check out Selkirk's pickleball nets. Get the freedom to play anywhere and everywhere and elevate your game with the net trusted by the pros. Selkirk's got you covered. If you're interested in getting a net of your own, go to selkirk.com slash collection slash nets and we'll link to that in the show notes. You can also find this link in the description of the show. But let's jump into this week's episode of It Feels Right with Robin Stone. Ding, 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 ding. It is. Adam Stone is back in the studio. You know, we it's been um we missed you. We missed you last week. We had Abraham Deacon fill in, which, you know, he he's not you, but he is him. And he's a he's a unique little character. Greg Dow came and came and said what's up. It's just been a smorgasbord. Smorg- that's a tough word first thing. I literally got caught in like the bottom of my throat. Cornucopia. I, 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 I'm, I've been doing some thesaurus work, you know, because oh. I talk about the same thing for 20 hours per weekend. So you got to mix in some different words at times. What do you have for, um, I need you to come up with a new thing at eight all. Cause if I hear, <laughs> if I hear Dave Fleming say double snowman one more time, I might lose my mind. And, and now I've like started just to roll with it and I'll like set him up when he doesn't do it. I'll be like, Dave, what are you doing? And that encourages him more. Dave, so I, I, out here. What are we, I, I'm, yeah. I'm into it. <laughs> I'm into it. Like it's gotten to a point and so many people talk about it that I, I want more actually. Oh, Where I know. I think some people want less. I want more. I want more. Yeah. So. I mean, it's, it's one or the other. It's either like, let's just make a complete, like, let's just be completely silly about this and go that way mm-hmm. or, or let's just stop it. But I, yeah. I like it. I like that route. Yeah. No, I, th- I think that's the play. And uh, clearly I need to give a big thank you to Abraham Dinkin. Eric Hot Toddy Roddy and Greg Dow. And I mean, Abraham Dinkin is clearly amazing, but I'm, I actually think the flow of Thomas Jefferson is just a bit better. Like it just, it just rolls right. It's like you almost don't even have to adjust the name at all when it's, you go with Thomas Jefferson. It's <laughs> smooth. It's smooth. It I really mean, fight, fight the Eisenpower is not bad either. It's just, it, it, it just, I just couldn't even imagine just. Sitting around with you know a case of beer with a couple of guys and just talking about presidents and historical figures that match up with uh, with pickleball terms, it's just too good. Harriet Dubman. <laughs> Harriet Dubman. <laughs> I mean, dude, he's the man. I'm trying a little bit early in the episode. And the so uh, good. the good. I used to follow his. Uh, oh, I didn't used to, but he stopped doing this. He's he po- like he posts on Twitter quite a bit or X, whatever we call it now. And he used to just always post like random pictures and be like, wow, great. This would be a great spot for a pickleball court. It would be like the entrance to the Bank of America building in Charlotte <laughs> of just like a front line. Like, whoa, wow, this would be a great spot for this a would. Dude, He's funny. Would be. Yeah, he's no, funny. It's, it's, it's good feelings. Yeah, well, I, I wasn't, you know, I, I kind of wasn't available. And then you uh, you pulled something out of your back pocket. And man, you picked a couple quality uh, guest hosts. I mean, it's uh, it's all credit to them because it was in the moment, and Roddy was like, "I'm I'm dinking right now, as Abraham <laughs> Deacon should be dinking, yeah, but I, mean, I can be on there in 45 minutes, so just yeah, give I mean, me a second. 
I mean, he's grinding, but he'll make time. He'll make yeah. time. Love that. <laughs> but now back to regularly scheduled programming <laughs> with Robin Stone. Oh, yeah. Here we are. Man, we, there's a lot going on. Always. There always is. It, have we ever been on here and there has not been a lot going on? I We have these like dead space <laughs> segments that we might squeeze in here and there, and there's just no time for it, Robert, because in the pickleball landscape, it's show and uh there is a lot of good a little bad a little ugly just everything that you could ever want uh, in terms of information and newsworthy topics but you know it's not ugly adam well one your hairline because it's it's perfect but two what the little guy here in the background which is mr aj and those easter pictures were i mean I, i'm just like oh my i was like i literally it was like that is the cutest kid like his little smile with his little titties pointing out and he's like kind of leaning back well, yeah god dude yeah and he's, i know you he's, said he's i know you said he's a, and i <laughs> i believe i i 100 believe that but <laughs> the way that little creature looks makes up for all of it in my book i know i yeah. don't i'm not the one waking up in the middle of the night or doing the car rides and the crying but i'm here for those pictures keep posting no he, he he's a cutie so five Five quality minutes makes up for the other 23 plus <laughs> hours of the day. Uh, but, you know, every everyone everyone knows that that's how it goes. But I, I, I could not agree more uh, when he gets all dolled up and he's in a good mood. Uh, he's, he's pretty dang cute. So uh, that little oh, outfit oh, he's wearing, dude, my God, the little the Easter seer, bunnies on it. Jeez, seer, seersucker. So I didn't even really know what that was. But uh that's the Apparently blue and white stripes, a, right? Or no? Blue and white stripes, little textured fabric, yeah. Uh, yeah. Easter pastels. The whole shebang oh was going God. on. So uh, I can't complain. It was a it was a lovely Easter Sunday. What'd you do? So we went to the Country Club of North Carolina, where Corinne's parents live, and had a lovely brunch. Nice. And, uh, What'd you guys talk some... about at brunch? Well, all kinds of things, really. You guys talk uh, about pickleball a lot at the at the brunch table. Yeah, well, they, Corinne was a pretty big part of getting uh, courts, the country club. So there, you know, there's the classic country club battle. You got the golfers, the tennis players, and then people want want the pickleball. And so there was several ladies that lived there, including Corinne's mother and Corinne, that kind of put the foot on the gas and made it happen. And they got four lovely courts kind of overlooking the lake. So it's a uh, it's a spot, man. It's a spot. Do you, speaking of courts, um, how's uh, obviously AJ throwing a wrench in a lot of stuff. Uh, but it doesn't matter because he's so <laughs> cute and he, like i said keep posting those pictures but yeah. do we have uh do we have a complex compound uh stone pickleball center in the future uh it's not going to be in the near future so uh we have a lovely plot of land but there is a pretty dang serious slope on it in the back and it really aesthetically looks wonderful but to build a flat pickleball court is not ideal so we're, we're talking retaining wall situation and a lot of money so yeah uh, definitely not a, a hard no but it's gonna it's gonna take a little bit of time if we are to go that route so it, it, it is sad it is sad but there's plenty of other things we need to do uh and that's what that's if okay. you just built it on the slope like, what, do you, what do you mean you just built it on the slope <laughs> Just built uh, it on the slope. What do you mean? What I mean, you just have yeah, to just no. you just lay the concrete on the slope. Forget the retaining wall. Just we can have an uphill downhill battle. I mean, yeah, switch, I you switch sides every game, anyways. Yes, I mean, talk about a side advantage. You know, you. Can, <laughs> just, uh, yeah, I don't think that would work. I, that I, would be I fun know. though. Like, which side do you think is the advantage? Playing uphill or downhill? Man, you can't keep that ball in downhill. It'd be tough. Like, what, like, what are you gonna do? I mean, and you're gonna fall in the kitchen a lot if you're downhill on a decent slope. Oh yeah, you got, you got. I mean, I didn't think we were going this route. Uh, and think about the think about slanted. the think about <laughs> the lobs you could hit when you're going uphill. I mean, you could just let it fly. And they, downhill, I mean, downhill, you cannot even think about a lob. No, I think you have to go uphill. I think that's the play for sure. Uh, you think downhill, uphill is I don't think advantage. you have. Yeah, yeah, I think downhill, you have no shot. I mean, it's similar to wind. I don't like playing with the wind. It's difficult. I'm, but think about it. But if you get that high ball on the down on the downhill, I mean, that thing's not coming back. You know what I mean? It's all over. It's going to hit and skid. That's that's right. So you just lob so and I, beam. I mean, yeah. That would be that would be. This is you know, tennis has clay courts. Pickleball has slanted courts. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, let's let's just. Let's just segue this lovely conversation into the tip of the day and start off with a bang. What do you think? Oh, I Rob? thought we just did it. If you're playing on an uphill court, <laughs> you lob. 
<laughs> no, that, that, that wasn't quite it, but that maybe that's for another day is uh, with the wind and against the wind strategy. Yeah. But uh, I think we're going to, I think we're just going to talk a little bit about defending the shake and bake. Rob. Oh, so, I like this. This is a, this is super important. And yeah, it's where, it's where Andre and I, like when we, when we lose games, it's, it's usually because of a team's shake and bake. Yeah. It's, it's, there's a lot of teams that are very quality at it. And I think at the lower levels, you have a lot of not the most skilled players, but they're very athletic coming from other sports. A lot of the, the, the age of the average player is coming down. Lots of pe- players in their twenties, very athletic uh, ladies and fellas. So getting in those quick, quick points can be tough to get out of. And I think it's really important to talk about some strategy. And, and I think that actually, yeah. So I, I think that there's been a lot of talk about, well, hey, they're hitting harder. They have better spin. Players have better offense. Well, it's easy. Kitchen to kitchen. We'll just get out of the way and let the ball go out. One, the balls are staying in more frequently. And two, when they're hit with more spin and more pace, I think there is a ton of players, especially in those mid-levels, that are not – it's not an option to get out of the way. It, yeah. it really isn't. Yeah. I will say in terms of third shot drives and shake and bake, I still think you have plenty of time and extra time – that letting balls go out really is a great option from that point. Granted, there is more spin, so you have to be careful, and that ball has got to be, you know, where it was maybe shoulder high, uh, you know, a couple years ago. Now it, it might be head high or higher uh, to, to where that ball is not going to go in with the amount of spin some of these paddles are getting. So Yeah, it's um, one of the – I know, Adam, you mentioned like early on when we were playing together, like in rec in Austin, that, you know, you recognize that I was – decent at like recognizing balls that were going to go out. I feel like I, I feel like that's changed quite a bit and I, I find myself struggling with it based on what the paddles can do now. Like I've, I feel like I've lost my gauge to an extent on what the ball is doing when it's head high. Cause there's been so many times where that ball is going in where as in, you know, a couple of years ago, there's no, there's absolutely no chance. You see, you see trajectory and swing, like how big it is. And you're like, okay, you can, feel pretty confident that's going out but now it's um it's it's much more difficult yeah and and it creates indecision too yeah. which leads to less crisp first volleys and more unforced errors on first volleys as well because you're kind of hesitating or second guessing yourself so that that's always let, letting the ball go out is, is always going to be a work in progress and it's i don't care if you're whatever andre dayescu or whoever it's just not something that's easy to do so yeah uh and then of course really the main thing is court positioning on your first volley and what you're doing with that first volley that is the most important thing in my eyes so uh, of course getting tight to the kitchen and not making uh contact with that first volley in the transition zone which is very difficult given uh some of the serves and and, and pace and spin on the drives these days but uh, uh, it is definitely something that is huge for how the point is is going to unfold. So, you know, maybe it, it could be court positioning when you return. Maybe it's the height of your return and the depth of your return that allows you to get forward. But being to the line is just so important when defending the shake and bake. Uh, yeah, I would say getting to the line is more important than like than hitting a heavier return. Like you don't want the sh- you don't want the return to be short and high. Um Cause then you're just going to get blasted. But like, if you hit a, if you hit kind of a floaty return deep, like getting, I feel like getting to the kitchen and being set is more important than, than cranking a return and being a foot off the line. If that makes sense. No, I, I do. And you know, with the spin created on the third shot drives, it kind of neutralized some of those returns too. Now, of course we want them driving on their back foot there. There's a lot of good things that come from that, but you just blast away and hit a great thing. Players, especially ex-tennis players on their back foot, can still create some some rotation on the ball with, with just being low to high with some of the grab that the paddles have these days. So also on that first volley, court positioning, but what are you doing with the first volley? So I, I, I mean, always I'm just hit it clean, punch it solid, have a n- nice compact stroke, but really kind of go after it and pin that player back deep. Uh, and try to avoid the player that's poaching uh, or, or, or baking, if you will. So I'm thinking that in certain situations, granted, this is a very difficult shot, but taking a bit of pace off 
of that first volley is going to be something that we're seeing at the higher levels and almost kind of conceding the kitchen when you are playing a team that is hot with the drive and the poach. If, if you're just constantly trying to pump that first volley back deep to the player that drove the ball, these guys are too athletic these days. A good poacher and is all over. A good poacher is going to be able to pick so many of those off, uh, especially with the spin created on the third shot. You're often hitting that first volley up and not kind of down or through the court as frequently. So I think that that kind of deadening the ball, and you don't even have to necessarily drop it in the kitchen, but don't give them that shot or that opportunity to pick the ball off when they're poaching when the ball is waist or above, because they're just they're they're, they're just too good at it, and it can really, like you said, Rob, have a string of points where just it's two minutes and you lost four or five, six points uh, off that shake and bake strategy. So just a, a couple of things that I'm thinking, and it is, this is a constant work in progress strategically, and we'll see how a lot of the teams kind of adapt. And if they, if they mix in some of these strategies uh, with the shake and bake, because almost everybody's good at it now. Yeah. Uh, it's a really good point because oftentimes they're, you know, you're, they're taking pace off the drive and it's more of like a three quarter dipper that you're taking from your shin and if you try to or even like let's call it your waist like let's call it net level high um you're still not able to like really hit down on that so if you you know if you volley it hard and hit through it it's still got i mean that volley is going to be waist level for your opponent which is going to be a very poachable ball so i think that's a smart you know we are seeing that more where if you're getting that ball kind of waist or below, you're seeing guys, yeah, just kind of deaden that volley. And like you said, Adam, conceding the kitchen. Because like when I'm thinking about playing a good shake and bake team, all like all I'm talking about with my partner is all we have to, because typically I feel like, you know, versus a shake and bake team, we're going to win points at the kitchen. They're going to win free points on shake and bake. They're going to hit good drives. You know, they're going to poach, we're going to miss some volleys, that kind of thing. So it, in my head, all it ever is against those teams is weather the storm, the first two shots, the serve and their third, weather that, get to the kitchen, concede the kitchen, let them come in. Because even though, you know, even though we're the return team and we should have the advantage, if we get to the kitchen and they get to the kitchen, we should still have the advantage. So I think, yeah, I think for an amateur out there thinking about it and you're playing a really good shake and bake team, just weather the storm, weather those first two shots. And um, yeah, you have to get like the thing I see the most is you have to get to the kitchen line off the return period. End of story. I don't care what happens. There's too many times where the returner is not getting to the kitchen line. And I think if you do, if you focus on nothing else, but hitting a return and getting to the kitchen line, that will solve a lot of problems because there's so many first volleys I'm seeing from three feet behind the line and you're hitting it at your shoestrings when you could be hitting it at your waist. Yeah. And I've kind of figured a little something out by accident. I'm, you know, pretty freakishly out of shape these days. So when I do play rec, I've been playing, you know, two or three times a month, something like that. I've been short hopping my returns and I'm like not that. even necessarily suggesting other people do that, but I've found myself right on the kitchen line for my next volley, you know? So uh, I think there's probably some players with skill sets that can do the short hop thing. But I think the same situation is if it's floaty and deep, it doesn't matter. It, it, it literally doesn't matter. If it's floaty and short, that's an issue. But flo if it's deep landing in the actually, back, you know. It's actually better because they don't have pace to use from you. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. So I, I have found with my traditional returns, that I was not making it in my accelerated age. And I went to the short hop uh, and there's, you know, a couple variations of the short hop. And I found myself right on the kitchen line for first volleys and handling drives much better than when I was hitting a more traditional return. So uh, I like that a lot. And also yeah, the, it's, it, it's, it's a huge factor. And, and we're both short hoppers. No, go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to say we're both short hoppers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Short hopping is good on thirds too. I think it's underrated on thirds. Truly, like if you can dial that in, it's like it's it's like hitting a good mid court reset. Sometimes that return will come kind of to the mid court, and you're just you're getting down and you're short hopping it, and you're right into the kitchen first ball. So I think that's like an underused, you know, tactic as well. Short hop, short hop for the win. Yeah, and and this is I know these are not easy skills to master, but this is. 
I mean, some of these matches I'm seeing, uh, pro level, 4-0 level, whatever it may be, I mean, we're talking 70, 80, 90% of the points are quick hitting points. So I know the skill sets aren't easy and the strategies aren't easy to execute, but we, I mean, we got to start talking about a variety of different ways to counteract what, what's happening uh, and where the game is headed. So uh, I think the, a few of those are, are pretty quality and maybe maybe grab one that, that makes sense with your skill set and, and, and try to work on that in your, in your rec play moving forward. Adam, what are your thoughts on, we talked about this a little bit last week with Roddy and, and Dow and, you know, Dow's not always known for the best takes per se, but he, uh, he, he had a thought that I really liked and I think it could make a lot of sense uh, just in terms of technology in the game and where, where we're headed. If we're, you know, if we're going to stay on this trajectory of the game being fast and faster and faster. Uh, I think it removes a lot of the, the strategy in a sense, like, you know, the longer points and not everybody wants longer points. So it's, it's a, you know, it's again, it's a philosophical question on where people want the game to go, but his thought was, let's just get wild with spin. Let's kind of remove some limits on the spin or open it up a little bit more and let's dial the, the, the power way back. Um, and then you can like, you're looking at, you know, wh- big, like really dippy drops, but not like crazy fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do really interesting angles, pull people off the court. Uh, you can flick balls that wouldn't normally go in, but now they're going in. So it's, it still creates like a really interesting element to the game, but I think it keeps the game more true to how it was originally intended. No, I, I, I like that a lot. And, you know, it doesn't. There's no way it was ever just going to be like 2018 and just stay that way. It's not yeah. an option, but I do like the spin component more. There's a big argument for both, you know, because it's like whatever. Like in the in the NCAA, when we're doing the NCAA tournament right now, you know, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it's you know backdoor cuts and give and go and you know box in one zone and full press and, and, and all this stuff going on and it it's moving more towards this guy's just more athletic and more physically. Uh, and I, th- uh, I think it's so boring. Men's basketball. Yeah, that's now. So, 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 so I, I know faster is good for, for viewing and, and it, it is, it's fine. They it create some interesting points some scrambling, some hectic stuff, but you have to find that balance of, of keeping the chess aspect and the strategic aspect in play. And, and I think dialing down the power and adding some extra spin could be a, a good way to do that. I, I, I mean, I remember those, you know, you'd have the whatever, the lower seated teams and they're just kind of figuring out how to do it. And now it's just my guy can my guy's tall. He can shoot threes. My guy, my guy is this and he's better than your guy. So it's just it's it's less appealing uh, from a viewer viewership perspective for me anyway. Yeah, I think it's it's gone to like you said, yeah, it's just it's gone to like when I watch men's basketball, for example, it's like they do like an isolation every trip down the court. Mm-hmm. It's like they put their best player on the ball, the best defender and the other four guys on the court um, are literally just standing around creating room. It's like, that's the strategy now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it might be the reason why women's basketball is being watched more and more outside of, of course, you know, the generational athlete, Caitlin Clark. I mean, that's the main reason we, we all know, but Women's basketball, they're playing real basketball, you know, off the ball, they're moving, they're cutting, they're setting picks. They're like, like you said, Adam, like kind of showing different defensive looks. Like it's, it's truly like there's, there's more going on and it's more interesting to watch because you're seeing like how they're trying to solve different problems. Like even if you put four players on Caitlin Clark, it doesn't matter. She's still going to drop 32 and she's going to have 16 assists. It doesn't matter. You can't stop a generational athlete. Um, so this, this is the problem that women's, you know, they run into trying to guard generational athletes and it's just, it's a more interesting sport. And I'm going to say generational athlete one more time, Caitlin Clark That's four. That's um, four. and just Adam, I don't know if I've told you this, but I'm also, a you know, Malin and I are now Indiana fever season ticket holders. I didn't get as far as like how we're going to get to the games, which games we're going to get to, but I do know that we are Indiana fever season ticket holders and not just that adam but um we've got pretty good seats so there's a lot happening in terms of caitlin clark right now she's playing tonight against lsu it's uh, i'm incredibly stressed out about it because i have a incredible disdain for kim bulky their head coach I, it's 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 an unhealthy uh dislike at this point but i think that's a that's a good that's my good little rant for um women's basketball thank you for 
giving me that opportunity. Yeah, I was going to cut Clark, you off, but generational that, that athlete. Just, that's five. Okay, so we okay. hit the five spot on that. And I, you know, I'm on the I'm on the Twitter, so I I got a little. I know the Mulkey thing, and there's some like New York Times article oh, about her or something. A hit, and a then hit piece. She's such a yeah. Baby, and then dude. this Angel Reese is that her name? The LSU player. That's Angel pretty Reese, good as well. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm a little in the mix there. So yeah. Uh, just a little pivot over to ladies basketball. Uh, some some good points there. I mean, Five? it's that's that's good. Yeah, I mean, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll just leave it there. I've got a lot more I could say, but I'll just leave it there. Uh, so that's the no, tip. I, you, you, Weather that, the shake and bake. Weather the shake and bake. Weather the storm. Weather the storm. Well, uh, Robert, we we have a we have a couple pretty important drafts coming up uh, for Major League Pickleball. There's a lot. We have the uh, premier draft uh, Tuesday night, uh, Wednesday evening, uh, challenger, and this is supposedly or, or hopefully, I'm not exactly sure what your word to use that these will be the only drafts moving forward. And then we'll have some form of free agency and trading and moving around uh, of the pieces of the, the uh, premier and the challenger level teams moving forward. And, and I hope that's, that's what happens. Things change so quickly. You never know, but it's pretty wild. So the premier premier league is going to be an auction level draft where you actually draft, uh, you bid for a specific draft slot. When you earn that draft slot by bidding, then you pick a player. So it's very unique. We have, we have, uh, kind when you of... say, when you say bid for, uh, sorry, I'm going to probably be asking a lot of questions here because oh, that's okay. I'm not that's super okay. familiar with the mechanics of all of this. So I'm going to be probably asking a fair amount of clarifying questions. So when you say bid for draft slot, um, are you talking about real money in terms of these teams and MLP owners putting up real dollars to be able to see like to be able to get where the, like if they want the one the number one draft pick that team's putting up the most money to get that pick well you get uh you get 500k monopoly money and but then that's you have for the, your draft pick right uh that that's just every team gets that going into the draft got it and then you have the option to purchase an extra five hundred thousand dollar to cap your overall money at one million dollars to play with okay and that so, that's how do you get that extra 500k you pay for it to yeah, how you much? pay for it uh the dollar value yeah you so, pay it's five, for the, so you could pay an extra 500k to right. get that one million cap that is correct yes that is correct so is that what um, also determines draft slot or what determines draft slot like how did the number one who, who's drafting number one in premiere oh we, we we don't know yet so we get to the oh. draft and there is a bid for the first overall pick it's not even a player you bid for the pick with all the other teams and you have that it, it kind of goes online and it goes through this interface and you end up if you secure the pick say you you get the first pick then you can pick whoever you want to but then you, you but that bid happens during the draft or before like how during the during the draft so there will be okay pick number 2 everybody goes and then the team that earns it has 2 minutes to pick the actual player that they want and that's so, real that's real money being bid uh no it's just for the no, draft slot i mean okay so it, so that's part of your cap that is part of your cap that is correct so that dollar value is not attached to the player at all that doesn't really mean anything that's just the money each team has to work with to kind of to, to work out the draft so the, the contract stuff all of that stuff is what the player is earning and kind of what they're getting that that money attached to them through the draft is just is just money for the draft so that everyone is on a somewhat level playing field basically but to, yes. but to be clear the bid like the amount you're bidding for that draft slot comes from your cap it comes from your cap that is correct so okay so you, so the you, bid and like the draft pick so it's all uh, yes. it's all debiting from that cap you have that's right so okay, if you you, you started it say every team starts with a million i don't think that's going to happen yeah uh, that's right you bid you bid nine hundred thousand on the first pick you have a hundred thousand to work with for your other three picks so there is a lot of you know, uh, usually these draft strategies and auction, which I was lucky to do a lot of them in baseball, it's do you have a more balanced middling team or do you go stars and scrubs where you where you get two heavy hitters and then you just kind of fill in? It's called dollar days at the end of the draft where you, you can almost get men priced players uh, and to kind of fill in your roster. So yeah, yep. 
it's very dynamic and every draft room is different. Some people just go crazy with the first their first pick and then some people kind of pull back and you can get some value there early on. So you have to be very fluid uh, as a GM in, in these drafts and, and make sure you're, you're available uh, uh, to, to adapt to the room. And this, I mean, that kind of, and my questions are probably going to make us pop around here, but based on just looking at that number one draft slot, I mean, is, is, is that going to be like a lock to be bent or is it, cause I know there's, I know there's situations with different players that they're not required to play all the events. Some might play four or some might play three. So what's that look like? Uh, it, almost all of them are six. I think there's a couple, uh, these are the PPA signed players that, that, uh, had six in their contract and the schedule this year for MLP is five regular season events, one regular season tournament, and then two post possible two postseason uh, uh, events. So yes, you, you have to do as a team, you have to do due diligence. So there's a lot of contact with owners and GMs with the players kind of feel, feeling out the vibe. Some players are no big deal. I'll, I'll do what the team needs. Some players are, are going to stick to their contract and that's absolutely their right. So uh, there is a variety of different contracts and, and a lot of moving parts to the, to the draft and just kind of knowing who is going to stick to their six and, and who is willing to, to, play a couple more and this I think this plays in more in 2025 as well we're kind of in a prorated situation here with half a season so next year I'm not sure exactly the number of events that they're looking for but it's going to be it's going to be more than this year because well, that's they interesting whole, right they have a because, whole year so that's interesting because uh, you know most of these contracts for the PPA signed players are three-year contracts right so if they're you know if they're on six events yeah they'll be able to play all of them in 24 but like, is that something, you know, you as a GM, for example, are thinking about in 2025, like, yeah, we get this pick for 2024 and they have to play all of them, but maybe they only play half next year. Like that's a, I mean, is that a real concern for a lot of GMs? Oh, yeah. No one for two years. And then one player from your team must go into the, you have to drop one player and put that into a free agent pool. So you're not even, that's right. So you're not even, it's not even possible to keep all four of your players, but you can keep three of them, two for three years, one for two year. And then you have uh, that one player that must go into the free agent pool to just kind of, I like this to, to not be able to just keep it fresh, to keep like, yeah, that's right. Fresh. And so you give, if a team drafted poorly, you give them a shot to, to dig into the, to the free agent pool and, and have, a, have a little switcheroo with their squad. So I, I, I like that. And I know it's, it, it is very confusing and I, I, I totally get that. Uh, and I think most fans, uh, you know, the diehards, probably a lot of people listening to this show are, are very interested in that. And some, you know, just want to see the play and the format and, and, and all, all that good stuff. So yeah. So any, that, that, any, that's, any tr- like what's the trade situation? Can... Yeah, so you so you can trade. I probably should uh, know a little bit more specifics on that, but yes, you 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 can trade, and that's very available. And you can trade at any time. Certain, yeah, if you have a certain waiver wire priority, you can use cash, and you can use uh, waiver wire priorities for the trades as well. So, like we talked about that free agent pool, you have to drop somebody. If you have the number one spot, uh, and there's a new up and comer or something, you can trade that for for value to another team. So. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on and uh, yeah, hopefully the, these rules kind of stick and hold throughout this, you know, next couple of years and, and uh, they become a little more smoother for, for everyone to understand. But I, can, I, I like can, a lot of what they're doing. I do. Yeah. It seems like it's on the right track for sure. Can you, can you trade from like one thing that I wish they didn't have was two different divisions uh, premier challenger. I wish it was just, uh, you know, MLPs a league and you have call it two divisions, North or East and West, whatever. Uh, but it's all, it's all the top level, if that makes sense. Uh, so it's just all premier 24 teams. Right. And, yeah, right, right. and you spread, yeah, you spread talent out a little bit more, obviously. And you have people playing, you know, you have the best player playing with, you know, oftentimes the lowest ranked player in the, in the league. Um, but are you going to be able to trade from premier to challenger and, and vice versa? Yes, I believe so. And like, I, I mean, I, I had, it was, it was 
Zoom call and a couple of conversations I've had on the phone and I have some notes on it that aren't with me. So I I don't want to give out any false information, but I believe yeah. that's how I under, understood it is that, yes, you can trade uh, throughout the year and between leagues as well. Yeah. What's the, and I don't know if you know this, but Ann Worcester and the Racket X panel said that there's many owners looking to sell, which I found it to be an interesting comment. Um, just, you know, just sharing that own, like several owners wanted out, um, I found to be interesting, but what is kind of the, you know, obviously the merger happened. Some people didn't want the merger to happen in terms of owners. Some did. It obviously happened. Is there a lot of like, like, are there upset owners that, you know, that, I mean, clearly there's owners that want out and is that based on, is that based on the merger happening and the direction that MLP has chosen to go? Absolutely no idea. I know, I know the valuation to the team went, teams went up after the merger, but I am, you know, I, I just, I, I'm not in that deep to, to know that I'm kind of more, you know, focused on the player pool and some of the rules and the format of play. I, I'm just not sure from like an ownership buzz perspective, like, like what, what, what the boys are, are chatting about or, or what sure. they were hoping, hoping to happen. No, sure. I'm serious. I'm just, I'm no. just messing with you. I'm just messing with you. No, I really I don't. That was a, uh, that was a, that was a question that I knew you wouldn't be able to answer, but I thought I'd ask you. <laughs> well, why, why did you ask it, Robert? You know that that's, <laughs> that's not my style right there. And I, I mean, I, I do have some good tidbits and uh, you know, some juicy gossip here and there. But I'm I'm more uh, yeah worried about uh, some of the format, and we're going full uh, full rally scoring as well. Games to 25, no freeze whatsoever. So there is zero freeze. You know, no 18, no one team can catch back up. Just full send. Have to win on your uh, ra- rally scoring, uh, playing to 25. Uh, yeah, so that's a new little wrinkle and a couple other things as well in terms of a rules perspective that nothing's grabbing me right now in my brain. But uh, yeah, it's uh, and, and I, I like that too. I think that's another thing tough to follow, you know, as a casual viewer, you know, the diehards, they, they, they know these things, but a casual viewer with the freeze and this happening and that happening. And, and also, I think that there was maybe some difficulty in terms of betting or setting lines or, or, or something like that when you have yeah. a freeze involved. Uh, so I, I think this for the grand scale, um, ma- makes some good sense. Yeah. I'd be curious on, um, what the thoughts are from everybody out there listening in terms of the MLP format now and whether it's, you know, we've had a big break with MLP and we've missed several events already this year. Is everybody still excited? Is there still like kind of the buzz and like, are people pumped, especially with all the opt-outs? Um, because, you know, quite a few, you know, the Johnson five are not in the draft pool to my knowledge, right? Yeah, no, that's, that that's true. And I think once, I mean, of course, I mean, you haven't played an event for a handful of months. Uh, I mean, I mean, of course, I think there could be, there, there is a dip of that just not being on the forefront of mind. But I think once you get back on court, uh, team format and, you know, everything starts rolling again, uh, I don't think it's going to take long for, for this gap to be in the rear view mirror. Uh, yeah, you know, I could be wrong, but I, I think it's going to be, yeah, like just a couple events in, it's going to be like nothing ever happened. And uh, it's going to kind of hold its, you know, what, what, what it had and some of the team aspect that, that made it really great to begin with. I think it's going to hold on to that personally. Well, it's yeah, I, I agree. And I think it, I think the format is what does that. It's, it's fun. I mean, even, even having a, like, even this podcast being mostly about updates to MLP and like what the, what the, like people like that stuff, you know, people like thinking about who's going to get drafted where based on the mechanics of this mm-hmm. and that it's, it's, there's so many more interesting talking points than just a typical tournament weekend. Yeah. Um, uh, and it, it, both. Both are good. I, yeah, I don't, both are good. I, the the mix of both is is what it should be. I don't know what the perfect mix is, but I couldn't agree more. Uh, standard tournaments are great. Uh, team formats great. If you find that perfect balance uh, between the two, that's got to be the ideal situation. I mean, I think the ideal situation is is. Uh oh, here we go. I mean, I've always said it. <laughs> I have. I've always said it. I think I I agree. There's there needs to be both. There needs to be both, but. I don't like the fact that they're kind of like on top of each other, like connected. Um, I wish that it was like, I've always said like a true 
team based league where uh, you know you're playing for your you're playing for your city and your team. You have home and away matches. You get the local community more involved and behind the team because uh, I think that's a people want to get connected to you know where they're from and they want to support the local team. And I think yeah, you don't have that connect if you know if your team's just always if your team has nothing to do with the city that the team's based out of, you know, you got to get there. You got to get there. So I'm not, not, not quite there yet, but I mean, man, this, all this stuff is so, so young. So in its infancy, you know, it's just, it's just a work in progress. I saw someone, I don't know who it was, something on, on uh, X, whatever you want to call it. And I liked this idea, a staggered dream breaker. Meaning what? Like one one team puts out whoever it may be coin toss situation. One team puts out a player for four points. Other team puts out a player for two, and then it starts regularly after that. So you get you you basically have to have females versus females, men versus men, and you must have men versus females in the dream breaker. Which I think I, I thought that could be pretty cool uh, because no the fans no no one players fans everyone loves it when it's a, a guy versus a girl matchup in a dream breaker. That is a fan favorite, and that was kind of a little tweak that maybe could uh, make that happen more often. Yeah, I like that. Uh, what they did at the Indian Open was a little different for the Dream Breaker as well. They they did it. W- it wasn't singles. It was um, it was each of the it was each of the four events. That's what rotated. So women's doubles would play. You could put out the lineup however you wanted. So you could have a mixed team playing a women's team. Or you could have, you know, the men playing the women. Same thing, but just doubles, which I found to be pretty interesting. So, um, yeah, you just put out your you put out your lineup of like we're gonna do women's, then we're gonna do mix, then men's, then mix, then then the other mix, and you just play the doubles points all the way through to twenty one. No, yeah, it's a there's lots of open, variations. It would be lots cool of to, variations. It, it would yeah. actually be cool to mix it up from event to event because it's it's a you know it's not like an advantage for it's an advantage to the doubles teams the, or you know the doubles teams where you don't have call it good singles players um so they're weaker on the single side there's obviously a clear advantage to the doubles teams there but i think it'd be fun to mix it up yeah no i i, I agree and still tweaks almost every time there's there's something slightly different or uh you know just trying to get it right and find that perfect balance like we talked about so work in progress. And I think uh, it's really grown leaps and bounds and we're, we're headed in the right direction with everything now. Uh, so I is mean, challenger, is challenger the same uh, kind of the same mechanics as premier or what's that look like? Uh, uh, the challenger is a full snake draft, just okay. a regular standard so snake no draft. Bidding, you get anything, you, no bidding. You just go back and forth and, you know, they were talking about having deeper rosters, but it is uh, to four. So they were talking about having six and challenger, uh, but it's uh, it is going to be for a standard snake draft, and, and you know, of course, prepping Sorry, for Greg that draft. Kyle. He was hoping for six. He was hoping, he was hoping for, six. for six. Oh, that's so good. Uh, yeah, so st- standard snake, like I said, and the hard nature drafting in the nine spot. So, like the, uh, what's the, yeah, especially in challenger? That's a great spot for challenger. Yeah, I like it. So you don't you don't really have to pick the last handful of picks which uh you know is nice of course it's going to be thinner in the back of the draft so you know you get that top couple pick it's exciting you can get a stud or or a big time lady but uh, you know deep deep in the draft sometimes the options aren't super sexy you know what determined draft order for challenger i have no idea i i I just know that my boy tim let me know that we had the nine spot it might i i would imagine it was just random uh but i i could be wrong so uh yeah i'm just How's draft someone prep who, going for you? I, I'm, well, I'm, I'm just someone who should know every intricacy whatsoever of, of the rules and the draft process. And I, I've been stumped a couple of times by your there's, questions, Robert. So there's a lot, uh, there's a lot going hey, on. I still have, I still have time to do a deep dive. You know, I got some calls today. I've, of course, I've done my rankings and kind of done the whole process of everything, but uh, yeah, there's still uh, a little bit of work to be done. And, you know, I've been, on the phone a little bit with some players, just kind of checking on some things and, and, and figuring out how, uh, what everyone's mindset is and availability. And, uh, we're going to, we're going to make it happen. And as silly as it sounds, I think fantasy baseball is going to come in big handy, uh, especially in the, the premier draft. That's a, that's an auction style. So it, it, it's going to be an exciting couple of days and straight from the draft, right into the, to the North Carolina open. So uh, it's going to be cool. It's, it's always nice to 
make your picks and then kind of see how they perform pretty quickly, you know? So yeah. it's, it's not going to take long. You're, you're, you're going to see how it looks. And of course, one tournament's one tournament, but uh, it, it's always fun to do that, to get your squad and then, and then kind of check them out and see how they do. Greg Dow mentioned one thing about, well, he's had baby fever for a while. You know, he sees oh like, he sees little AJ and he's like, I've got <laughs> six months to get somebody pregnant because last year in Mesa at MLP, when we were on the Brooklyn Aces, he was like, man, I have uh -huh. baby fever so bad. I just want, and he doesn't have a girlfriend. He hasn't had a girlfriend the whole year. So, but he's like an eight by, by the end of 18 months, I will be, he said a father, but he, he just meant like, I will, like he will and be getting somebody someone. pregnant. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I gotcha. So he's <laughs> like, he's like, man, I've got the clock's ticking. I've got, what is it? A few months now. He's so, uh, but he did mention based on the baby fever thing that he's seen Scarpa. It's, it's happened to Scarpa where he had a kid and then, you know, uh, switch flips where he's just like, you're, you're not, you're playing for something bigger than yourself now. And just wanted to say, um, I think sleeper in this draft is DJ young. He just, you know, big congrats to him on, and his partner on their, their new baby. Very cute. But DJ's got something bigger than himself now. So watch out for, watch out for Maybe. Mr. Young. It's the tweak that he needed to take him to the next level. We we know he's got the shots, so maybe that shots. just that mental umph that he got from uh you know bringing uh, like a, life like into a, the world is uh, must provide to get him over that over that hump. Ooh. Must provide, must provide, must provide. Uh, Robert, this was lovely, and I, well, I think we like you we said a, about MLPs leading right into was it Kerry? Is that where the events at? Yeah, Kerry. 15 minutes from me, I get to oh, sleep in my own bed, which is pretty. Adam Stone's dream. Yeah, it's the only tournament of the year. There's a couple I can drive to from here, but mostly it's it's pretty heavy travel. So, yeah, so we, we, we got really two of the main things for, for the tournament and, uh, and carry is uh, McGuffin and Ignatowicz are back. So both, both missed a handful of tournaments. Uh, I believe it was a foot and a shoulder. Uh, for Tyson and James, respectively, and so that's that's pretty exciting stuff to get them back. Tyson, clear clear cut fan favorite, and uh, Ignatowicz, you know, bringing that power and some really great results over the last six months. So uh, great to have them back. Yep, is uh, Tyson and Deckel playing? I believe that is correct. Yes, and then Tyson James and, and James and Matt Wright. I believe they are back in business. Yes, so interesting in women's doubles as well as Lucy Kovalova and Callie Smith are not playing together. Uh, I believe Lucy is with Jackie Kawamoto, and let's see here. Don't have it here. So that's ah. Uh, Leah Jansen and Callie Smith. So I mean, okay. I can't even I can't even remember the last time those two were not on court together. I mean, it's got to be two plus years at this point in gender doubles for those two. So uh, that would like be really. Those, I like those switch ups. So that's I think it's I think it's great for both of them. Honestly, I think it'll be a good. It'll be yeah, Lucy, Jackie. I think they have the potential to do really well, and Callie and Leah as well. Yeah. So that that's that's an interesting look uh, uh, for sure. Oh, look at that and the defending medalists from men's doubles. The Rattlesnake and the Canadian Beaver, Steve Deacon, with a nice little bronze medal last year in this event. Oh, yeah. I did not I did not know that. That's one of my favorite interviews that I've seen Steve Deacon do. Oh, it was last what, year. What, tell me about it. I love it was, Stevie D. It was last year at North Carolina, yeah. He um he played with Travis and then I think they played Tyler Loong and somebody. I don't remember who Loong played with, but you know, after they won that clearly. And then Deacon during the interview was just like, look, we were going to make Tyler dink and it was going to be up to him to win or lose it for them. And he we won. <laughs> yeah. He was like, the plan was to make Tyler dink and that's what we did. And what? here we are. We won. Here we are. <laughs> and, uh, we, I mean, that's good stuff right there. Oh, we got, uh, Thomas Wilson and Alshon back together as a, five seed and they could face the John Zai in the quarterfinals. That's, Ooh. that's quite, that's quite a quarterfinal matchup uh, right there. And then uh, let's see. Oh, shocking defending medalists and women's doubles waters in Parento. But honestly, that's uh, a, that, that Christian and Thomas matchup, you know, I talked about kind of that strategy with like the, the Zane and Alshon when they got that upset is I hope I hope Thomas and Christian don't just stack on the same side the whole time. I I hope they, they yeah, on on returns don't don't switch off the returns. Even if that's just how you play. You can stack stack on your serve, but like just don't switch. 
Um, I just think, yeah, Alshon's doing really, he's doing really good stuff off the bounce. I think he's worked on his disguise and he's finding a lot of holes. Um, and it's, yeah, they can be, they, yeah, that, that's a, that's a dangerous quarter for the Johns. Yeah, no, the, the forehand off the bounce from, from Alshon is ridiculous. It's gotten and, much better. Yeah, and the and the backhand is very much less there, but he's so athletic, it doesn't really matter. It's like he can almost speed up off the bounce with the forehand over 75% of the court because yep. he, he, he's got that movement to get back to where he needs to be. So, yeah, I Zane can do it on both sides extremely well, and I think Thomas and, and Alshon are – much more pigeonholed into that forehand speed up, but they're such freak athletes and they move so well. It almost doesn't matter at that point because they can hit forehands from anywhere. So uh, yeah. yeah, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's a very dangerous team, especially early uh, as they can catch fire as well as anyone. And I do not expect them to full stack, maybe a half stack situation. Uh, but I think the fluidity uh, of both of them on both sides is completely fine and keep them out of those patterns that we always talk yep. about. So, yep. Uh, let's see here. Oh, just a couple storylines. Uh, we got some mixed doubles here. Oh, we got Julian and Paris Todd. I don't know if we've seen that one before, but that's that's possible. And uh, Prento and Sock back again. They have not had the results they were hoping for the last couple tournaments. Let's see if they can uh, turn that around. And then, of course, uh, the clear-cut two seed that they've earned it is uh, James and Anna, and I just hope he's uh, fully healthy and can – slap those uh, head high and shoulder high forehands because he's going to need to and basically uh, both gender and mixed doubles uh, being that left side stud with Matt Wright and then clearly uh, in mixed doubles so I think there's I talk, some fun stuff fun yeah, stuff going on in North Carolina I talked to James a little bit about his kind of goals for 20 and he thinks it's realistic that he can he, he doesn't think you know he says you know to get to number one in men's is probably a little bit of a stretch this year. Uh, but he wants to kind of his goal for 2024 is to be the kind of the clear cut number two in, in men's and the mm -hmm. number one in mixed. And he thinks that's doable. What are your thoughts I mean, on that? I think, I think it's reasonable. He's got the skill yeah. set. He's got the desire. He's got the work ethic. Maybe he trains too many hours on court given the shoulder injury, <laughs> but I, I, I mean, anyone with with that skill set and that drive and you know having being in his mid-20s and just kind of letting it fly i think that's very reasonable i mean dude i didn't he, realize he's only 23 yeah i know that's what i'm saying it's like what else is he doing nothing yeah he's hanging out with anna and he's drilling and playing and you know meditating and locking in visually about what goals he wants to have and what he wants to do of course he can do it so uh, yeah. i would say probably the men's doubles is the more difficult of those two as the mixed doubles. He's, he's, I mean, he's, he covers a lot of court and he hits the ball very hard. Uh, no one can take either one of those away from James Ignatowicz. So uh, yeah. I think it's, it's a reasonable statement. Yep. So we got obviously, yeah. I mean, good MLP recap. We got the North Carolina PPA coming up. We've got, I'm, I'm kind of returning. I'm returning to action this week, Adam. I'm going to see how the body holds up. I'm playing uh -huh. the APP down in Delray. It got mixed on Friday. Men's with Mr. Eric Lang on Saturday. Oh, it's and Lang thing. It's Lang mm. season, you know? So, uh, yeah, that'll be fun on on my end. going to drive down tomorrow and try to get some practice because I have not been well, practicing. Well, hey, well, be ready because Lang going to be speeding it up. So you better be ready with the hands so on the next I. ball. <laughs> so am Lang's I. Gonna, Lang's going to let it fly. Uh, no, that's good stuff. Uh, always hoping for the best for you, especially physically. Hopefully uh, it's a smooth tra transition back on the court. Uh, look at us. I think we're just under an hour. That's that's what it's, – it's hard. Once we get on here, once we get on here, Rob, we got so much to talk about. We like looking at each other, and sometimes it gets a little over, over that hour the time. Mark. Where's the time at? It's in the see top the right time. corner. It says 56, and we had a slight interaction uh, with Kren Carr there and the baby that we're going to have to edit. That we're going to have to edit that out. We're going to have to edit that out. There, there might have been a, a raising of the voice somewhere between us. But, you know, that's that's life with the baby, and that's okay. It's healthy. It's all healthy. It's all good stuff. It, I mean, yeah. It's, edit, it's, edit, edit. it's all in love. Let's, let's it's, it's leave it, leave it, leave it. Josh, you know a, what to do. Josh, you know what to do. Leave it, leave just it. Just a bunch, it. bunch of love. That's right. Uh, but yeah, no, great stuff. And it'll be, I mean, uh, the, what we'll have the recap for North Carolina next week and, uh, tons of information, uh, from the draft that we can kind of pick apart. So, uh, yep. good stuff. And yeah, 
Thank you for listening. Obviously, Selkirk puts this on for us. We appreciate them. And we'd love to hear what you guys oh, think in the is. comments about in. MLP, about little AJ, about Prof, how Prof and I are going to be on the pod soon lighting Adam up because that's my favorite pastime. And yeah, appreciate you guys. Oh my <laughs> God, that smile. Oh my, <laughs> my God. He's so cute. My guy. Uh, no, lovely, lovely. Uh, good stuff, buddy. Okay, next time. Thank you.